Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for co uh, coming out here today. I'm Mike Boostein. I'm from Think Ahead Software. I'm going to present to you today how to use Couchbase Lite with Xamarin. Oh, they're creatively titled How I Lost 30 Pounds with Couchbase Lite. So everybody could use to probably look, not everyone, but maybe some of you could. So um, people ask me, clearly when you see me and you've seen me before, um, if you've never seen me before, maybe not, you know, how, how did you lose all this weight? So there's a picture of me and all my fatness uh, um, from the Evolve conference last year, the Xamarin's Evolve conference. I used to work at Xamarin. Um, so, you know, that was pretty exciting. But you can see I was in pretty, pretty, pretty bad shape. So I'm headed in the right direction now. So I tell them, you know, the, the answer is pretty obvious. You know, how does anyone lose weight? It, it's, it's straightforward, right? The same way any norm, normal person loses weight. Um, I started using Couchbase Lite to get an easy abstraction around offline data access and mobile apps while gaining nearly automatic syncing with my server. It's, that's the way everyone would lose weight. So I just took the normal approach. So and it's worked out pretty well. All right. So, what, before I get going, a um, little, little bit, I'm, you know, to, to, not, to not be too uh, uh, arrogant about it, I'm, I'm pretty much an expert at Xamarin. You know, I've been using Xamarin since before Xamarin was Xamarin. Um, Couchbase Lite's quite new to me. Okay? I've used it a little bit, did some work uh, with some workshops with one of the fellows from Couchbase while I was still working at Xamarin. And so it seems quite straightforward, but I'm, I'm approaching and coming to this and presenting this talk as somebody who really knows mobile development, both native and Xamarin. Um, quite well, and what would adopting Couchbase Lite for someone who knows what they're doing in mobile apps be? What's it look like to somebody like myself, right? So I'm um, certainly not an expert in Couchbase or Couchbase Lite by any means, but you know, my, um, my sort of onboarding here and getting this talk together and some other short, smaller work I've done has been pretty um, pleasant working with it. But before I get into Couchbase, I'll talk a little bit about Xamarin. I see a couple familiar faces. Who, who's not familiar with Xamarin in the audience? Who, who's familiar with Xamarin? Every, every, oh, sorry, so we get, we get, a, we get a, good, good. So I'll, I'll, that's good. I'll just uh, go over it a little bit then for the couple people that aren't familiar with Xamarin. It's a platform to develop, develop native applications using the C-sharp or F-sharp languages. Builds on top of an open source project called Mono. Okay? So you can build native applications for iOS, for Android, and Microsoft, of course, delivers .NET and C Sharp and everything in Windows, um, even though Xamarin has some secondary products to work there as well. So the, the, the benefit of the whole thing is you get shared app logic, as you can see in my little slide here, where it's kind of cross-platform, you know, partially cross-platform. The code that could be cross-platform that doesn't need to be platform-specific, things such as web services, XML parsing, JSON, anything that you're dealing with that um, doesn't need a platform-specific API. Uh, web services is a great example, would be able to work in shared code. Certainly, you could still use platform-specific APIs, um, but there's no big reason to, unless you wanted, you know, they, they offer some, perhaps, a, a, a bit of performance in one area or another. Not often. Xamarin and the .NET base class libraries all together in mono underneath work pretty well, um, perhaps if you're porting code. But all in all, you can get this kind of shared core and then you redo your UI. That's why it's not completely cross-platform. You're redoing your UI as much as somebody who are doing, say, Java and Objective-C, except you're doing it in one language. They have another product that does give you some sharing in UI as well. So that's the idea. So it's part cross-platform. It's a good thing in that the end user develops an application, or the end user is using your application that you've developed. They don't know it. It was developed in a tool that's not directly from Apple. Because it's building on top of Apple stuff, or not directly from Google. It's building on top of Google stuff, right? But you can still share a lot of code. And so you save time, money, and work with a really pleasant, or two really pleasant languages. Mostly C Sharp is what most people are working in, although F Sharp is quite nice. I encourage people to check it out. So the main product from Xamarin it was formerly called MonoTouch. Right? So if you see older things around, they say MonoTouch. MonoTouch is Xamarin. And it was rebranded to Xamarin.iOS by the marketing gods. Um, similarly, for the Android product, they have Mono for Android. It was what it used to be called. Now it's called Xamarin.Android. So those are the two main products. And that's what, you know, when people talk about Xamarin, kind of focus on these two things. There's a bunch of other things as the company's grown that they've developed. They have a Mac product that's very similar. So if you wanted to do desktop Mac, Mac applications. There's a test cloud product, which nothing to do with any of that. But if you wanted to test your applications in an automated server, you know, device farm, um, it provides a great way to do that and need not even use Xamarin. And some various other things. Xamarin Forms is that UI abstraction I mentioned. and Some other things that complement 
the existing products. So, but when we're talking about Xamarin and what I'm talking about here today, the core of it is Xamarin iOS and Xamarin.in. Android. That's sort of the bread and butter of the thing. And that's the, where the majority of the customers lie, right? And that's what I'll show you here today. So what's Couchbase Lite? Is anyone, you know, many of you probably know more about Couchbase Lite than I do, perhaps. Is everyone familiar with Couchbase Lite here? Is anyone not familiar with it at all? No, not, not a surprise, not a surprise. Um, so good. Um, if I say anything wrong, please, please uh, help me after. So Couchbase Lite provides a document-based data access um, on these platforms, right? All the platforms that Xamarin and Microsoft target too, which is interesting. And there's different versions of Couchbase Lite or different flavors of it. You can use it, of course, Objective-C and Java. They've got this, everything works through their REST API, so the JavaScript guys are in good shape. But it's really nice from .NET, and they created a nice API around it. It seems very, very idiomatic for a .NET developer from what I've seen so far. So that's kind of cool. Um, so you have that. Kind of, you know, I won't go into like what, I, what I've seen of how it's implemented underneath. It really kind of doesn't bleed through what it's, its implementation. Perhaps it, you know, where it would use SQLite or other things. It really abstracts things nicely into its API from what I've seen. It provides an offline API, so you could use it completely offline, right? So even just in that, just that alone, you take all the couch-based server part of it. And it's, it makes storage nicely abstracted and really easy to do. Um, if you're just using it in a mobile app, which maybe has simple storage needs is from, a, from a programming perspective, depending on your features. In indexing over you know, MapReduce-based views, that's how they do their querying. I know they have this new nickel thing, it looks like on the server, but you know, that's how, how I've been working with it in um, Couchbase Lite. Seems like the way you have to right now. And that's quite, quite nice, actually. Right? So you can create queries from the views. And then this is the sort of killer feature. If you go beyond, to me anyway, if you go beyond just like doing it in your mobile app, and I wanted to sync, right? Because put it up to a cloud, and have it go to different devices, different users. Um, it makes this kind of thing, to get started, certainly really easy. And to even go to a production kind of, it has all the capabilities to go beyond that really easy scenario, like what I'll show you today, to do more advanced things. As you've seen, I saw Zach earlier talking about filtering. They have these channels, and it's uh, pretty impressive. But to get started as a developer and get up and running, it was um, pretty seamless. Right? They distribute the .NET flavor of the thing through NuGet. So it's really friendly for .NET developers. NuGet's a package manager um, that Microsoft originally developed. It works inside of Visual Studio then, of course, and also has great support inside of Xamarin Studio, Xamarin's IDE, okay, which you can use either with Xamarin. Right, so that's how you can get Couchbase Lite, and how I get it in a demo that I'm going to show you later on in the talk. So I've got Couchbase Lite, and I've got Xamarin. And I talked about the kind of benefits from, from really not just a programmer but business perspective that you can share all this code and still have a native app, which is great. So the users don't suffer. You can still, you're only you know, limited by your creativity and what other market factors try to get people to address to try to get apps in the top of the app stores, right? The technology is not going to hold you back. And that's great. So you get all that without Xamarin, right? You, you get document-based data access, offline support syncing. But when you put it together with Xamarin, I mentioned web services, XML, JSON, anything you'd use in shared code, Couchbase Lite really lends itself to Xamarin versus, say, if you were to do this exact same thing in Objective-C, and I say this kind of talk all the time I've done over the years about Xamarin, you'd have to write it twice, right? I'm going to write some web service code. I've got to write it twice. I'm going to parse JSON. I have to write it twice. Um, if I do it in Android, the twice being. So here I don't. It's, it's a perfect scenario for working with Xamarin. I can write my Couchbase Lite code once and share it across my iOS and Android projects. And so you, so you kind of win in there, right? And that's the, the normal reaction. Um, so you can see that's Miguel. He, he, he created Mono and Xamarin. And there's Zach. I, uh, I photoshopped out another picture. It's in, uh, is Zach here? No, Zach's not here. He was here before. So I thought it was a funny picture, but you know, maybe not. Um, so let's talk about the Couchbase Lite API a little bit, right? And just coming into it new. So you have this manager class, and from the .NET developer's perspective, manager class manages access to the Couchbase Lite database, and they expose it through this um, a singleton, which you can get at through manager.shared instance. So really easy. You know, that's that's kind of your entry point into the world. You could use that to get a database. Okay, so I have in that code snippet there. I'm going to just say, hey, give me uh, a database, and. It, just if using it locally, that's what you would be. You wouldn't have to get down into the using SQLite or some, some other um, ORM on top of it. You could just use this if you wanted. Okay. So then when you get the database, what's the database do? It encapsulates you know, the Couchbase Lite database and you know, um, provides all these APIs that they have. And the APIs do, do the normal things you'd expect with something that's dealing with effectively data access, right? I can create documents, read them, update, delete things, right? 
but you don't have to use anything else. You can just use color space light, and it's pretty sweet, and then it'll work with, when you're using it with Xamarin, the same code can work across platforms. So they work with these things called documents, right? document-based data access, you know, they use JSON underneath them. It represents, the document class is what represents in the .NET API a couch based light document, okay? As we saw there, you can, you can use the document to, to that's where you're, where you're saving things, where you're saving your data. Um, it allows saving and retrieving through a dictionary if you're coming at it through the .NET APIs. You know, you'd go through like a hash map or something like that in other languages. Um, so you just have dictionary-based data access and it abstracts the details of saving everything in in, that you'd want to save. Now, there's a bunch of APIs off of the database to work with documents. You can create a document. You, like I said, CRUD stuff, get a document. You can update. There's a couple ways to update. The one I put here on the slide is uh, you could just put properties. So just props would be a dictionary there, and you could update it. And you could delete the document, of course, with a delete call. The update one's interesting, and they have another actual uh, um, method called update. My understanding of it is that if you used update, update will take care of, um, say, we haven't talked about syncing yet. If you had some syncing replication going on, and there was some sort of a conflict, you, if you were just going to do it with like throwing the dictionary in directly with put properties, you'd have to write your own retry logic inside of there, whereas the update one gives you a callback, and then that, uh, that callback already has retry logic built in, and it'll just recall itself re recursively, and within the callback, you can handle your own conflict resolution. So you know, that, that's probably, uh, you'll see in the demo I did, I, did use it in, I didn't use it in one place, and I think I, I fall down in a couple places so every so often, so hopefully it'll work when I run it. But, we also have a couple options for updating things. Now this gets really interesting though, right? So nice, easy you know, data access model. You just kind of deal with documents and I can save effectively dictionaries. So I can do a lot with that, even before I get to the syncing part and then it gets really cool. I also have this idea of an attachment. And this is really interesting for mobile apps especially. You often have you taking pictures, you might have some audio, you have some other kind of binary data. And so if I wasn't using, so even if I was using you know, some other data access technology, some abstraction on SQLite, regardless of whether it's document-based or relational, um, I'd have to deal with, you know, I'm going to have files as well. And I might have a pointer and some kind of scheme I'll, um, I'll come up with to say, hey, this is where all the files are stored, and then I have to relate that to my metadata and so on. With this thing, they encapsulate all of the, the details of, of file storage. Things like if I was going to save a picture, an image, for example. Um, and they put it all in this thing called an attachment, much like an attachment if you're dealing with email, right? It gets stored addition to that. So not only you have the abstractions, you have to deal with the platform-specific APIs, even going through Xamarin for storage, file, file access. You get this encapsulation of it such that it's related to the document. So I can get it, a, you know, the document and the files that, you know, the attachments that go with it, I can get at those attachments by knowing about the document. They know of each other via the identifier. Kind of neat, you know, rep, um, represented with MIME types, right? So very familiar to people for, for years. So you're going to work with it a lot, you know, as far as rep, you know, dealing with what I'm storing there. It's just like if you were doing attachments in various email APIs. And they do, a, they do some neat things. Their storage is smart. They'll, with, what I, I hope I'm going to say this correctly, but it seems, sounds like what they're doing is, it looks like what they're doing is hashing the name of the file, the attachment, when they go to store it based on a hash of the content in the file. So that's great. So then if I go and I, and they're space limited, these devices, I go to save a different, you know, I think is a different attachment, but it has the exact same content. It's not going to save it twice, right? Because it's just going to internally store it with a hash of the, the content. And they do some other smart things, I think, um, with syncing too, from what I was seeing. So pretty sweet, pretty sweet. And, and you know, again, you come through C Sharp, it's, it's excellent that I can then do it with just one API. So I'm, I'm getting you know, storage for you know, not d these documents, which is just the data part of my application that aren't files. I get this abstraction around files to store things, and it's all related together, and I can query it. It becomes really, starts getting really, really powerful. Their querying approach, what they do is they go through, I said earlier in the talk I mentioned, they, they use views, couch-based views, not talking like UI views or anything. And now, you create a view, you create a query, and then you run the query. That's the basic idea of you know, how they're querying things in this guy. So what the views are is the views are basically an index on your documents, right? All, all your data, what you're storing. And you know, they, they create them through MapReduce. Everyone, anyone not know what MapReduce is? Okay, good. I won't explain it. For, for, for people that are coming from .NET, it's a lot like, um, you have it already, just people, they don't call it that. It's, it's, it's a lot like this, the select function. Um, it's like map, if you do any, anything about link. Um, the aggregate is, is like reducing. So they're doing this to basically, you'd map around all the documents in the data storage, right? You get a um, call, and they call it an emit function. I have it down in here. 
and you get an emit function back. So when I set the map, I'll get a chance to interact with this lambda expression. For any document that comes in, I could filter things. I could do whatever logic I want, and then I can emit out um, what I'm actually going to put out into the index. Okay? So pretty straightforward, actually. Um, once you create these views, kind of the big reason to create them is you create queries from the views. So I have views like their index. They have a nice support in the .NET API for asynchronous. I think in the other APIs, too, I saw. But they have nice async support. You can see here, you can just call on the view that you created, create query. Once you have that query, you run it, or you run async like that, and it supports you know, async and async await and whatnot. And then you give this query enumerator back from, from the query enumerator. You can enumerate you know, the results and pull out all the documents and subsequently get at all the properties in every document. Quite straightforward. Um, there's a few properties you can set on the queries themselves too, like the order and you know, the number of, you can set the limit, you know, the number of documents that would come back in a query and so on. Okay? So straightforward to create queries. As an aside, there's also a, a convenience one that I found was really nice. You know, maybe you wouldn't use it in production perhaps, um, that you can get all the documents. You don't have to, have to create a view. If you just say, hey, give me a query that gives me all the documents back, um, that would be painful, I guess, if you had 100,000 or something, you'd want to page them and whatnot. But for getting going really quickly, you can get yourself up and running. They seem to do a lot of things like that to try to get it so that the API is convenient for a developer to get started. If not, that you just got to know that you might not want to use those things as you go forward in your app. Um, I did do that, though, in the, um, the app I'm going to show you. Okay? So it's like, at this point, you've got a lot. You've got this easy abstraction around data storage. You've got ability to create indexes around all the documents you, you store things in. Um, you can query on them very easily. And then you can uh, atta add attachments as well. And you can do that all from cross-platform code. And without any syncing or server, that for me would, would already be enough for me to want to use the thing. Okay? Just even on the client. Shoot, that would be great. It is great. They, they got more. When they start talking about how they use, do, deal with it, interact with their real product, you know, their, not their real product, but their, their larger product, Couchbase, and the Couchbase server, and this sync gateway they have, and that's where it gets compelling. One thing they have is this, this thing called a live query. And the idea of this live query is that I, you have you know, the server, obviously, and things can change, and data comes in, and they can, the live query can listen for changes. We usually observe changes. They expose it. There's an event here in .NET. You know, that's not technically observed, but you, you, you can see that when, when changes would come in, the live query can be effectively you know, notified that there's changes, and you can then update your user interface, right? You create the live query from a query. Now, I, I didn't show it in here, but I might, I might do it in my blog, or I, I have it on my, my list of things I want to do. Is this, this idea really lends itself to something called reactive programming, um, and there's a, obviously great implementations of reactive programming in .NET, this is where it came, out, came from, through reactive extensions, and there's a nice UI framework called um, reactive UI, it's an MVVM reactive framework. And those two things together, combined with live queries, just seem like peanut butter and chocolate to me. I've been playing around with it a little bit, but nothing I want to, um, I have nothing really great to share yet, but I'm gonna, I have a blog if people want to check it out, gratuitous self-promotion. But anyway, these live queries look interesting. Um, so now we start talking about like, okay, now you're out of the world of like, well, I'm live querying because data's changing. Asynchronous data screams, what, what not. Um, how do you get data from this thing that you stored locally up to the Couchbase server so you can even care about live queries or, or whatnot? They have the idea of syncing built in, you know, replicating data. And they have a product called the Sync Gateway. And the Sync Gateway is a, a service, you know, a little server that sits in between your Couchbase Lite and Couchbase. And it handles the syncing be of things between the two. I'm sure you all know all about it, I imagine. Um, and then there's a JavaScript function you can put in the middle to control a variety of different things, and it can, it can be secured, and it can be, have authentication against it. So there's a lot of uh, additional features as you go into production with it versus what, just getting started using it in development. That said, if you're just getting started using it in development, like I was, and I still am, and you're new to it, it's really easy to get going, right? And what's even more, if you're even new, coming new to Couchbase, but hey, you know mobile development really well, they have a built-in um, in-memory Couchbase, I don't want to say I call it Couchbase server, but they basically, in the sync gateway, they have an in-memory store, for lack of a better term, so you don't even have to set up a Couchbase server to use it for development. Now, obviously, you can do this in production. So they, I think they call it Walrus, as I recall. And so you can just set up the sync gateway with this guy, and then you can just start using it from your app. Right? And then you can bring in your development for the actual connecting it to the real Couchbase servers later. So again, making it really convenient for developers, I, and I like that. Right? The API is really easy to use as well. They have push and pull replication, 
as I mentioned, the in-memory server, and they give back these replication objects. And you just, there's a few other properties and things you can tune on it. And you basically start and stop your, you start your replications, not stop, to some URI that the thing is running from. Okay? So, that's what I get there. Let me come over here and I'll show you a demo. Um, I'm fully get the thing running. I ran it here before. So I've got, let me run it first and I'll uh, explain it later and we can walk through a little bit. So it'll be good here. So I've got an iOS um, simulator. I'm just going to do it all from the simulator here on the left. And I've got the Xamarin Android player. It's an emulator that they have on the right that I use. It's kind of fast. So. And I'm just going to make a, you know, call this app two, and uh, you know, whatever this is, app two. Okay. And hopefully it'll work here. Good, it worked. Um, I think I have some. I, I didn't hit that business about conflict resolution. I just ignored that. So it's like th there are cases where if, if I start doing a lot of things often and the, it's syncing at the same time I'm updating something on the other end, I, I don't handle the conflict gracefully. So so. Yeah, it's a demo, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'm actually going to look into adding that as, as before I publish this. But you can see here I did that, so then it updated on the other side, right? And um, if I come in here, for example, in App 2, I can also edit. I made this little mock-up thing. So I just has this little, you know, I'll just draw something. I don't know. You know I'm not creative. So I just, like, draw a little you know, checkbox. I don't know. Mock-up an app, a little doodle thing. Uses OpenGL um, to draw with, actually. And I can come in here, and I can save it. And I did that on App 2, right? And I can come in here. You see, yeah, I, I text box. But see, so it, it synced it in and moved it across. So what that's doing, so now that I've shown you that, you know, I could delete two, I could delete one. It would delete. Okay? So now that you've seen that, so I had data and I had some drawing thing. What I do is I actually, the, the drawing part just uses OpenGL. There's actually a, a .NET implementation, um, low level, sort of, well, low level, but there's a binding to OpenGL called OpenTK. It's been around for some time, and that's, that's available in Mono and in Xamarin. So you can do OpenGL code from C Sharp, okay? Um, and then what I do is I take, a, I use it, I actually, I use an API to um, get the image from, from the OpenGL context, and I draw it, and then I get an image out. What I'm doing is I'm taking the image, and I'm saving it in with a couch base light as an attachment. It's just an image, right? That's it's a JPEG at that point. When I'm using, so I have a document. I have that list there. That's a bunch of, you know, a bunch of my objects in, in my little app there. I'm saving them in a list view on the Android side, a UI table view on the iOS side, and I have the attachment, the attachment being saved in Couchbase Lite with an image. Just an image, image or anything. This is what you would do. Oh, this it's replicating to a Couchbase uh, um, sync gateway that I have running over here in, okay. I have running over here in, um, in Linux. Okay. You have a question, sir? I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah. I haven't done it, but I mean, the answer is yes. I'll say it out with, because you can save any files. It's just mime type. It's just any attachment. I'm sure as you get into larger files, there's probably considerations and things you may need to look at, like you know, moving any other large data up and down over the web. Um, but certainly, the, the, that's supported audio. You know, it's just like any anything you'd be able. You, know, you got to think of it like the way I'm thinking of it is, you know, just like if I was adding writing an email client and I was putting attachments in there. So I'd have size considerations. Perhaps those files can get big. But yeah, I totally support it. Any file type, you know, anything with a MIME type. Right? So that's kind of sweet. All right, good question. So here's the so I did it in development. You could even you know you could run it on on the Mac in OS 10 or whatnot. I, I just ran it. I thought it was nicer to run it in a separate machine. So I just ran a I just ran it in a Linux box here. Well, it's really easy to get the sync gateway, get started with it. Again, you just, it's, it's very, they have some very, very simple install instructions just to get up and running. And you, know, you want to get into how you authenticate it, how you secure it, and, and whatnot. But I just did it with a little config file you, you set up that they have, and, and um, sort of mostly the defaults. And I just, you know, I'm wide open, so I'm just doing it for de demonstration. But you can, it's not even hard. I, I did do it in another exercise to authenticate to the sync gateway. It's actually pretty straightforward, too. So here I have it running here. It's just the install and setup is, is really, to get going is nothing. And I'm using that in-memory database. So the idea is now, it's like someone, you know, someone else on your team goes and they come around and they build a couch-based server out, right, or farm a couch-based servers. You can change your sync gateway and subsequently start talking to what they call them buckets, talking to those guys. And your client code with couch-based light doesn't change at all. Because right, it's talking to this sync gateway. Your sync gateway would, you know, you're going to have some work you would do around how you secure it and, and, and how you move data up and down is going to be taken care of between sync gateway talking to couch based server. So it's kind of nice. So here I'm just using the walrus thing to do it in memory. Now let me show you the app here. See if I can make it a little bigger so you can see. And this is a, 
you know, obviously the sync gateway, if you were coming at it through Objective-C or Java, you'd be able to, or, or JavaScript, you'd be, able, that's all the, you'd be able to use all that technology there. I'm sure a lot of their customers are. But I think it's, you know, I'm obviously a, a kind of biased. I, I love Xamarin, I work there and all, but this is a great, you know, this is a classic benefit of doing something with Xamarin versus other things. Not that those other things are bad, like Objective-C or whatnot. It's just, it just is. It's a, this is a, just a great scenario. So here, here I have this app, I called it, I originally called it notes, then I decided to make it mockups. <laughs> mockups and determine was just changing a label when I put that little thing behind it. But I'm saving, I have this application called, um, this is the iOS application here. Just a native iOS application just happens you know, to be, I'm doing it in Xamarin. And I have all the normal things I would do. I won't go into the, if people want to grab me after, I want to talk about Xamarin and the iOS, you know, the, the Xamarin development itself. I'm happy to go into more detail on the, the non-couch-based side of this with people, but we'll stick to the couch-based part. But I've built this iOS application, and I'm using UIKit, UI Table View Controller, um, pr pretty straightforward things. And I have the drawing part using OpenGL. So it's OpenGL ES via OpenTK. That part's a little unique to, to Xamarin. You would just do it with OpenGLES if you were doing it with Objective-C. Um, that code could be shared, OpenTK too, so it's one of the few areas you could actually share UI code, drawing code. Um, the way I wrote it, it actually won't be because the touch handling I did when I, drew the, when I was doing the drawing, I used iOS APIs for that, but I could change that quite easily and make that work on Android too. So I just did the image part on Android. So then I have, so I've got this iOS app, well, let's look at this Android app down in here. That's kind of nice. You have it in the same solution. And I'm sorry I can't make that, that a little better on the left anymore. But, you know, it's no, normal business. I have an acti you know, activities, a list activity. You know, I have the data adapter business that you use to, you know, just kind of hook up lists with AXML, you know, XML-based uh, declarative UI. Um, normal stuff, right? So just, just iOS and Android technologies happen to be through C Sharp. I come along and I say, how am I going to do some storage here? Now, you know, again, I'm doing dem kind of demoware code. I just made a static class, and I have this shared code. I might have done, you know, non-static class and maybe had an interface and abstracted this a little more, but it works fine. What I'm doing is I put it in a shared project, my Couchbase Lite code. It's a little off the top of the screen there at the top, but you'll have to believe me. There's a, maybe I'll move it down a little bit. Yeah, you can see there. So I have this, this, this part here. That's a shared project. So there's two kind of ways you can do sharing in Xamarin. You can do a shared project, or you can do a portable class library, a PCL. Shared projects are easier to work with. If you're an app developer and you're only trying to share the code across your projects, shared projects will make it easier. It's kind of like glorified file linking. Microsoft introduced it a little over a year ago and then Xamarin adopted it pretty quickly. Portable class libraries offer a variety of other things, but the benefit of portable class libraries, you can, you can package your, your code up into a, a library, a, you know, a DLL that could be used in, if you were distributing, if you're a controls vendor. Couchbase Lite, you know, if you want to package it up as a PCL, you could. So if you're just trying to share your own code, a shared product's going to make that a little easier. But you could, that's just, it's in the eye of the holder. You could use it. I could just as easily use a PCL there. Um, I think that would be fine with Couchbase Lite, too. I haven't actually tried that. But, you know, certainly for very general purpose share code, you could. So I have this shared project now. And there's nothing, I, this is in. This is, this is where it's great. Couchbase Lite can be used completely in shared code. And I can use it in iOS and Android, just like my you know, Objective-C and Java counterparts, uh, except they're going to have to write Objective-C code, and they're going to have to write Java code. It's the same code they're writing. What a shame. So I, ha I have down in here in the iOS app, all I do is I reference the shared project. And down here in the Android app, all I do is I reference the shared project. And there's this knows nothing. All it knows is it's going to just do, you know, this is like your, your basically your, OR, your little layer around Couchbase Lite, the same thing, kind of thing you would write if you were doing SQL or any, any kind of storage thing in shared code. Again, I just did it in a kind of crude but simple way where I just had this little static class. And inside of the static class is where I'm doing all those APIs I was talking about in the slide. Called it a note that that's like the mock up. I changed the terminology at the last minute. And so as I'm just using those APIs here, I'm getting a document. I have a dictionary. And um, then I put some properties into it, right? Which I guess they use JSON underneath it. I want to get notes. That's that query I said that's a convenience one where you can get all documents. I didn't do it in this app, but you could create a view and I can do the map, you know, set map and give it a lambda, takes the map, the MIP, and get the index from that. And then you can query on that. Right. That's just a convenience one. And then you know, the, to show here, what I was more interested in doing is like that I can enumerate it back. Right? So that's what I get back when I run the query. Saving a note, same idea. I'm either going to, you know, I can create the document and I can put properties into it. Remember I said that wouldn't handle you know, any conflict resolution. You can see I'm not handling conflict resolution, but you know, you'd have to roll your own timer type of thing and like retry logic. 
um, not necessarily a timer, but you have to roll your own retry logic. And then I got you know, down below it. This is where I was actually um, um, doing a save with the actual update call to show. So it's like when I was updating it, I, I, I actually used the update method. Again, though, I'm kind of, that's that callback that would get re replayed if it uh, ran into a conflict resolution, but you're supposed to put conflict resolution code in, in the callback, so I didn't even do that. But you know, that's the two kind of ways you can update. Delete is just again DB. See how easy the API is. It's crazy. And get doc. Um, um, you just get the document and you delete it. You know, very straightforward. Get going. And this is the part where I do the attachment. That's all I have to do. All I have, and I'm just working with an array of bytes because then I'm going to give those back to the to present to the and I let the native um, platforms deal with how they present. You know, in, images on the native platforms. You do it with a bitmap on Android, and then they have an image view control that you can set the bitmap data on. On iOS, I can turn that um, byte array into an NS data, and an NS data I can present in a, a UI image and subsequently in a UI image view. Exactly the same as if you were doing it from Java or Objective-C, only I would do those from C-sharp. In the shared code, I'm not going to have you know, anything about Android bleeding in. I'm not going to have anything about um, Objective-C or, or, or Coco, Coco Touch bleeding in, like UI image, something like that, NS data. I just deal with byte array. Okay, so everybody can, everyone can understand that and be used in both, sets, both, um, both platforms from shared, shared code can just be referenced. Okay, and, and, and the way they work with attachments is they work through the revision API, on, you get a revision of the document and you set, sorry, it's over it, you set an attachment. There's the, the MIME type I talked about. I just gave it a name JPEG data because I don't know what to call it and I just pass it the data and then I call rev save, right? Do a little handling. You know, obviously this is a, this is kind of demo where my my error, you know, any exception handling I put in was you know just throwing it out console log, which will dump it out to application output. Um, would go to any standard output wherever you're 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 directing that to. Okay. Similarly, you can read the image how I got it out, and I read it on both the Android and the iOS side to show on the screen. I can get that out from I can get the document, and I just get the attachment off of the revision. Okay, and I do it with that in that string that I put up above. Okay. That's how I key into it. And I can get, um, you basically get the data back. You just, you know, in my, in my case, I, I'm trying to put that into a byte array. I'm in .NET, so I can use, you know, normal .NET business to turn it into a byte array. So I just use memory stream and I did a copy. It's, you can do an inline thing that would be a little more efficient, but, you know, it's, it's pulling hairs at that point or splitting hairs. I think it, it would, it's fast enough, right? Um, certainly for a demo. So that'll get me back my array. Now, the syncing um, to the sync gateway, they have a really, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, RESTful kind of how the whole thing works. So all you have to do is have some function that builds up a URI and you know, give it a DB name that you're using. And just like, that's it. You just pass back this URI and this is a URI that your sync gateway would need to use. You have to use that port. So I knew it and I hard coded in that, uh, that um, IP address there because I checked what it was before here. Right? And it's just my one running, my, un my Linux box there running in my virtual machine is all it is in this case. Okay, so a little helper method to create the URI. And then I'm gonna use that up in here when I call uh, um, on the DB, again, how you do it, to create pull and push replications. So pull the data down, push the data up. They do them independently, do the same object, the same class type for the object replication, right? And then there's other kind of properties you can set on these things. You can control how they authenticate, and what, they have these idea of channels that you can control what users would be able to go to where and some other things like that. And this property I said here is called continuous, which allows that it's constantly happening. Well, it's constantly replicating. They have an event handler. Again, they, they make it pretty idiomatic. And in the event handlers, you can find when a rep, one of the replication objects has changed. In my case, I just was really crude. I just said, oh, let me raise it. Let me just, uh, I'll invoke a delegate to just you know, notify back to the, you know, the caller so they can you know, update update the user interfaces. If I was doing this, I might make it a little more loosely coupled than that and maybe do it with some kind of a messaging API or um, um, something else, you know, in, in, rather than just having a delegate that I invoke. But, you know, f f works. And that calls, so every time something replicates in and it works okay and I didn't have any conflicts um, and everything worked all right, it'll just say, hey, the replication's changed and then I can write my, my code in my platform specific thing. I can handle how I want to update my user interface. So on the Android side, you know, I'm just doing normal Android things there, whereas I update the data adapter you know, to update the user interface, you know, the, the list adapter that puts onto a list. On the iOS side, I update the UI table view. And I did that a very simple way. I just reloaded the data, reloaded the rows rather than being granular. So I was re refreshing every single time that whole list there. So you can tune that up a little, but it doesn't change the idea of how it all works in any way. All right, and that's how it all, that's kind of how it all pulls together. Right? And then when you, when you, you run the thing, you, you can see uh, this is this code here started to get into quite a bit of code, even for a simple little thing like this, 150 lines or so. 
I, I just come in here and I just reference it and I can just start using it. And I know it knows. And the, and the, and the, the native platforms, you know, the, the Android code and the iOS code, for example, I'll show you. Here's the, the, new, this the table of control here. This one's a little small. I can't double click. There we go. Come in here. You'll see nothing about Couch Based Light in here. I'm just referencing my shared library. So it's like, it makes it easy. You know, I could even develop the whole UI out first and I can like introduce Couch Space Light later. What I'd probably do is I would maybe do it that way, have some mock data, program my data access layer to some interface instead of having a static class like that. I would just have a bunch of mock data in the interface and then later I'd rip out the implementation that has the mock data and I'd put in the one that has the implementation of Couch Space Light, like some I storage or whatever you want to call it. And you know, it would be the same thing as my static class. Wouldn't work any better or worse. It would just be, allow you to kind of develop in pieces and, Without, a, you know, without having a lot of temp code that you wouldn't have to throw away, okay? And there's, like I said, there's a crude thing that reloads. I could do it more granular than that, but this is just iOS code, and it's the same on the Android side. All right, so with that, I think I'm right about 35, 30, good. Um, come back over here. It's my demo. I, have, I, I really brushed over the iOS and Android, Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android specifics there because it wasn't really what I wanted to go into. I just like come from like the assumption that people already know that. Anyone wants to talk about the details of how you work with Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android themselves, independent of the culture base life, just see me after. I can talk about any topic um, on, on Android or iOS um, you know, that, that you're interested in. But you know, um, I find you know, just a sandbox, you know, standing on a soapbox rather, a little bit. I'm finding Couch Based Light to be very approachable um, for someone who already knows there's a lot to know in mobile development for sure. Um, I'm finding it very approachable. Like, it's just like another library you're kind of bringing in. Certainly, I know there's a lot more complexity as you get into Couch Base, you know, on the server. But as a mobile developer on the mobile side of it, I think the work there, as you can see, it's, it's quite straightforward. Really, if I just started handling conflicts properly there and w introduced some security, to this sync gateway, which is not hard. I've actually done that in another project. Um, you know, I think I'd be in pretty good shape, actually, mobile development-wise. Clearly, I'd have to write a query. I'd have to do more than just like get the all documents query back. You know, but nothing, nothing, nothing super challenging. I think that from the mobile side of it, I think it's it's really straightforward to integrate and get going with. It's really straightforward. So, I encourage people to take a look at it. And if that, anyone have any questions? I don't, it's, it, it, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure the detail, I, I don't understand the details of how, the, you know, the syncing fires off. I mean, certainly probably, I, I'd like to know that myself. Um, you can, yeah, it, it, and I'm, I'm running it locally. You know, my, my Linux machine is actually running on the same machine. I got it in a virtual machine, but it was pretty quick. Um, I had it set up with, you know, I've got another setup where I configured it somewhere else off of, into another machine. I was just trying back home, and it was pretty quick there too. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I, it doesn't surprise me that, that it's fast and you know, this, is, this is kind of their product. What's nice is like, I'm, I'm not writing on, you know, imagine the code you'd have to write there. Right? You'd have to handle offline, you have to handle network reachability, you have to handle storage. You'd have to write something to handle conflicts. I would just have to write conflict handling code in my application. How do I even know that there are conflicts though? I'd have to write that code. I'd have to write, do that on some, you know, some kind of an asynchronous way, so I'd have some threading introduced. That makes things a lot more complicated. I mean, this is, it's not the most fun code to write, for sure, and it's sure not easy. I've done this kind of code, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a hassle. It takes you away from your application you're trying to develop, right? So it's like, and I won't get it right, and I won't get it as well as I'm sure these guys could do. This, is a, this, is, this looks great, you know? I mean, certainly, there's gotta be a ton of, you know, the actual couch-based side of it, as you're now you're buying, you're buying into the whole server. That's where I think there's a lot, of, a lot of skill and a lot of, nothing to do with mobile development, where I think a lot of the work would be. Bringing it into the mobile app, though, I'm, from what I'm seeing, looks real straightforward. And to answer back to your question, I'm, I don't know the answer, but it, quick. <laughs> but I, I, maybe we can find out we're in the right place, I think. Good question. Any other questions? Well, great, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for being so attentive.